Ms. Nasser is a professor of journalism at Columbia's Graduate School of Business. She's trained as an economist and has written for the New York Times, Fortune, and U.S. World and News Report. She's also the epitome of modern globalism, having grown up in Germany and Turkey. And now, before she comes and joins us for the conversation, there's a special treat to introduce you to this subject. My name is Sylvia Nasser, the author of Grand Pursuit, the story of economic genius. The history of economic progress in four minutes. 1811, the average Englishman lives little better than a Roman slave. Potatoes are a luxury. 1840, the mid-Victorian boom marks the beginning of the modern revolution in living standards. 1842, Charles Dickens writes an instant bestseller, The Christmas Carol. He calls for an end to class warfare and better wages. 1850, Henry Mayhew, a founder of Punch, invents investigative reporting with a 90-part series about London's poorest workers. 1866, labor's share of national income is rising. Karl Marx's own income puts him in the top 2% of British households. 1867, Das Kapital goes to press without Karl Marx ever visiting a factory. 1870, Alfred Marshall wonders why every man can't be a gentleman, someone who can afford to enjoy leisure and to educate his children. 1898, Carnegie Steel triples output without increasing its workforce, thanks to superior management and brain workers. 1908, Beatrice Webb invents the idea of the welfare state. 1911, Irving Fisher endorses the idea of a diversified stock portfolio. Maynard Keynes disagrees and advocates buying and selling one stock at a time. 1918, Keynes convinces the British Treasury to invest in French paintings instead of French loans. Irving Fisher invents the cost of living adjustment, raising his staff's salaries in step with inflation. 1929, Austrian economist Friedrich Hayek predicts that the U.S. boom will end in a bust. 1931, President Herbert Hoover responds to the Great Depression with tax cuts, easier money, and public work spending. 1936, Keynes loads up on U.S. stocks and becomes wealthy. 1945, Hayek warns that government control of the private sector will destroy political freedom, yet supports government action to promote post-war economic recovery. 1952, Mao Zedong comes to power. China's standard of living is only 50% of Africa's and 5% of America's. 1960, Joan Robinson denies that the Great Leap has resulted in famine even as Mao declines foreign food aid. 1963, Paul Samuelson says he'd rather write the nation's economic textbooks than its laws. JFK proposes a tax cut that leads to faster economic growth and a falling federal deficit. 1979, Milton Friedman convinces President Jimmy Carter that easy money and too much regulation is to blame for the nation's economic woes. 1998, Amartya Sen becomes the first Asian to win an economics Nobel. 2010, even after the worst financial crisis since the 1930s, U.S. per capita income is still higher than at the peak of the 1990s boom or in the mid-aughts. For the story of how economic genius has changed history, read Grand Pursuit by Sylvia Nasser. So that'll save people some time if you haven't read the 800, 900 pages. That's in four minutes, the history of economics. Um, so could we start just by, um, could you talk a little bit about why did you write this book? Well, I was looking for a really a glamorous, sexy, topic that would appeal especially to all my girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and what do your girlfriends think? About 
Well, they claim that it's a good read. Uh, <laughs> seriously, um, I was, of course, looking for uh, a good story. Um, what I didn't realize is that uh, it would take, um, you know, it took about three weeks to find the story of a beautiful mind and to get it into the New York Times. Uh, it took about, of the 11 or so years since I got my contract with Simon & Schuster, um, maybe the last two years were spent actually writing the book, but the first, the first eight or nine were spent trying to figure out the story. You know, ha what's the narrative? What's the compelling uh, tale that uh, one could weave about from all this fascinating material, all this history and ideas and, and people's lives? And it's really the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> Um, and for a long time, um, if you read the book, you'll notice that in the chapter on Karl Marx, I spend an inordinate amount of time um, highlighting the 20-year writer's block that he had, uh, uh, you know, uh, trying to finish the first volume of Capital. And, you know, I seem to take special pleasure in quoting his letters to Engels, who of course was supporting him. It's, it's, done, it's virtually done. It's um, uh, for all intents and purposes done, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I had a lot of sympathy for that. So you, you um, if, if you do read this book, you weave in all kinds of, the, all of the characters or the geniuses that you're showcasing, and this is the way you, your narrative art goes, is through the lives of um, these economists who have had so much influence on economic thinking and, and the evolution of economics. And um, somehow you manage to weave in these, all these fascinating details about their lives, their loves, their longings, their losses. Um, and, and I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about some of your favorite uh, geniuses that you, and, and, with, and I'll preface this with a confession, which was um, my favorite was Beatrice Potter Webb. And of course, I kept on wondering when Mopsy, Flopsy, and Cottontail were gonna <laughs> jump in and, until I realized that there's a difference between Beatrix and Beatrice Potter. Right, although. <laughs> I have um, young children at home, uh, so. Although when the Boston Globe ran its review, um, and you know, Beatrice Potter, Beatrice Potter Webb was really beautiful and rich, et cetera, and I made a big deal of that. And when I opened the uh, Boston Globe Review, there's a picture of a rather homely woman. It was Beatrix. Don't make the same mistake <laughs> that I made. Um, but talk a little bit more I about do it. Wanna, I do want to talk about the characters, but I want to say one thing first, which is that economics um, is driven by history to a greater extent than, say, pure mathematics, <laughs> uh, more like, you know, biology or, med or particularly medicine. Um, and so, so how this narrative is built is really around the, um, the circumstances, the events that pull people who were not, you know, who didn't um, uh, at age 15 say, oh my God, let me become an economist. Um, the people who were wanted, who were writers, who were scientists, who were mathematicians, who wanted to start businesses, um, were drawn to economics because of e events and circumstances that drew them in and made them focus, first of all, on the economic problem, however it was defined in there, um, you know, at that time, and they discover the 
that economics is this engine of analysis that they can actually use to, um, uh, to maybe do something about the problem. So that's, what, so that's what's, um, in a sense, driving, driving the narrative. And it's a series of, and mostly, it's just like, um, mostly it's economic catastrophes, depressions, wars, um, financial crises that somehow draw the attention of these, of these people and, and pull them in and make them, you know, off, often reluctantly because economics has never had a, um, you know, quite the curb appeal of, say, mathematics or physics or art, uh, drawn them to the field. And, and so can you talk about some of your favorite? Okay. To, All right, so let me talk about, your... um, about Beatrice, uh, who is the third, sort of the third major character. And she steps on the stage uh, in the, um, when she's a debutante. She's the daughter of, she's a wealthy, beautiful heiress, the youngest of eight or nine girls. Her father is um, a railroad tycoon but although an unusual one who, who has intellectual interests, so she grows up with, um, um, you know, hobnobbing with people like Herbert Spencer and every, you know, every major scientist um, of the era. And what's interesting about her is that she's, nobody asks what a woman like her is going to do. Why? Because it's, too obvious a question. Obviously, she's going to marry, like her sisters did, a hopefully rich and powerful man. And, but instead, Beatrice, at a rather young age, starts to form another ambition. And that is to have some kind of creative, intellectual life, hopefully one in which she can influence the world around. And so her story is really one of, um, of self-invention. And what makes it very poignant is that it's such a struggle. And it's not just a struggle, it's not particularly a struggle against her family or against, because um, the, you know, because Upper class women, of course, had more freedom than any other women in the late 19th century. It's really also a struggle with herself. So for years, she's torn between this passion for the most powerful politician in England, whom she's hopelessly in love with, even though he's a... Uh, sort of patriarchal, he's really looking for a political wife who will support him, and, um, and particularly one who will not have opinions of her own. And um, so she's torn between that and becoming, under the tutelage and with the encouragement of Herbert Spencer, who you probably know as a social Darwinist, but who was actually a great moral philosopher as well as a great scientist who invented the term um, um, survival of the fittest, but under his tutelage to become a social investigator and influence uh, um, British policy by uh, you know, a scientific analysis of society. Okay, so, so her first the way she dives into it is by, um, by going undercover. You see, investigative journalism was really hot in Victorian England, and... Um, it was just invented, that, right, by the That's right. Part Henry Mayhew, and... um, you know, whose series ran even longer than the newspaper series today that are aimed at you know, winning Pulitzers, um, 
had invented it. It was very powerful. It was a very powerful way to affect uh, legislation. And so what Beatrice did was um, um, she decided that she was going to go undercover as a sweatshop worker. Because that was, this is the 1880s, that was a big, there were, you know, this big Jewish immigration, a lot of sweatshops, it, big issue. And so she spent, here she is somebody who, of course, had never washed a dish or picked up a needle uh, or otherwise m mastered any domestic art. She, you know, spends weeks learning how to sew. She moves to East London to some seedy rooming house. She gets old clothes at a pawnbroker's, and she walks the streets uh, looking for a sweatshop, and she miraculously, there must have been a big labor shortage that day because she actually gets hired, and, um, you know, and um, she lasted about two days because um, despite the help of all the, you know, these women who were in the sweatshop, she really uh, was not that great at sewing on buttons. But the piece that she wrote about, you know, society, society girl goes undercover sweatshop um, sort of started her, um, started her career. And, um, and she, um, you know, dined out on it and, you know, and enjoyed the, uh, the press coverage of her journalistic debut. And, and she really ended up um, inventing the notion of the social safety net? Well, yes. State, right? so, um, so Beatrice wound up inventing the think tank, okay? She was someone who had grown up with and who had dinner with, uh, you know, all the prime ministers and, and um, legislators and, you know, all the movers and shakers in British society. And she knew that politicians had no original ideas, okay? You know, they were too busy, you know, selling, they, they were too busy selling a program to invent it. And, and so she recognized that they would have to turn to someone to, for those ideas. And when she finally gave up her hopeless passion for Edward Chamberlain and married the son of a hairdresser, a short, not very attractive Cockney um, Fabian socialist named Sidney Webb, Webb, who was George Bernard Shaw's best friend, um, she, um, set up a, they became a two-person think tank. They not only churned out studies of things like trade unions and um, poverty, but they also held a political salon that everybody who was anybody went to. Okay, so she invented the think tank. Then she invented the idea of the modern welfare state. And sold it uh, with the brilliant, um, the brilliant line that, and actually um, uh, economically very sophisticated line, that, um, it, that was a kind of a supply side argument that the, you know, these extra taxes that would be required to provide a minimum standard of, of living to every British citizen would, um, you know, would be more than recouped by extra economic growth because the bottom third of British society was so poor that they couldn't, they, they were economic dependents instead of contributing economically because they were so ill-nourished, in such ill health, and so illiterate, okay? So her argument was against the conventional wisdom that, um, that any kind of welfare system like that would uh, undermine economic growth. She turned that argument around, and her, um, her most famous protege, uh, 
at least early on, and this was well before World War I, was the rising young political star, the former Tory, new uh, uh, member of the Liberal Party, Winston Churchill. So you're, um, so she and others sort of stand at this evolutionary point where um, really the thinking was that you could not change your lot in life and the lot in life for most people was dismal, it was woeful and to really an emergence of thinking that no, there was, there was, um, there was an ability to affect the welfare and mobility, social and economic mobility of people through, um, through, through economic thinking. So could you, you, you and, and it's fascinating how you trace this through the, um, through all these folks. Do you want to talk about that? Right. I mean, the um, grand pursuit is really about a new idea, an idea that emerged in um, Victorian London that was so radical, an idea that was so radical that uh, someone as evolved and liberal in the you know, old-fashioned sense of the word and sensitive as Jane Austen never entertained it. And, the, that, and that idea was that humanity, and particularly the bottom nine-tenths of humanity, um, could take its own fate into its hands and mold and influence and direct its economic circumstances. Now, the reason this was so radical is that for 18 centuries, for all of recorded history, we now know that um, the average standard of living of the average person on this globe um, did not rise above subsistence. That is, above the level required for the human species to reproduce at the same average rate as any uh, you know, animal species, okay? What that meant was that the average inhabitant of uh, Jane Austen's England had a standard of living that was no better than that of a Roman slave, and probably, in many cases, worse, had a um, food consumption that was significantly below uh, that of a modern, a member of a modern, like 1960s, hunter and gatherer tribe, okay? And what did that mean? It meant that nine, nine out of 10, maybe 95 out of 100 human beings lived like uh, high-end livestock. Uh, there was no question, you know, there, nobody wondered wh what are they going to do? You know, what are they going to do with their lives? Because it was too obvious. Of course, they were gonna do what their parents and their grandparents had done, which is to scratch away and live a life of absolute drudgery, poverty, and a life that was short, and one that entailed knowing that your children were simply gonna repeat the same bitter experience. And within 50 years, by the, time, by the time Charles Dickens is writing um, The Christmas Carol or David Copperfield, uh, and remember that David Copperfield, the big question for David Copperfield is, am I going to be the hero of my own life or will that role be played by someone else? And with, you know, at that point in the middle of the 19th century, something changed that made people like Dickens feel that, that what had seemed to be immutable and, and fixed and frozen could change. 
that this bottom nine-tenths of society might have a future that looked different from the past. And that was, that ran counter to all of conventional wisdom. Um, you know, whether you asked William Thackeray, who, you know, said, I don't, you know, who, to whom the idea that you could do something about poverty was, you know, like saying that you were going to abolish winter. Uh, or John Stuart Mill, who was a progressive, feminist, Democrat, socialist, who did not believe that any of the incredible technological inventions and economic changes that were taking place then would ever make the lives, which were making the nation richer, would ever change the lives of the bulk of the population. Or a socialist radical like Karl Marx, who, uh, you know, who knew that not only were things, could things not get better, they were actually going to get worse for the bottom nine-tenths. So the fact that, you know, that at that time there were people with imagination like Dickens who saw a different possibility and were calling for a new economics that was based on the idea that things could change, that, we, that humanity could take its fate into its hands. That was the beginning. And that's what each of these characters um, seizes and moves forward. So, so as you, um, so from that perspective, and as you emerge from this book, are we all a bunch of whiners for complaining about 9% unemployment compared to how things were back in? Um, of, of course not. I mean, I think that, um, look, today, after 150 years, the average standard of living in the world uh, is ten, you know, has, has multiplied tenfold. Okay, people live two and a half times longer. Poverty, you know, extreme poverty, which used to define, you know, 85, 90% of the world's population, has now become, instead of the universal condition, is now an exception. In other words, it's, you know, 15%. Okay, it still exists, but it's an eyesore, it's a problem. Why? Because it's not, you know, it's not the human condition anymore. Um, so, and, you know, if we just look back at the last 30 years, we've obviously, until 19, uh, until, you know, 2008, you know, we, we, all of us in this room, have experienced 30 of the most prosperous years that uh, any, gen you know, any group of Americans, any inhabitants of this world have ever experienced of rapid growth, very shallow recessions, uh, you know, rising wages, you know, tremendous technological progress. So, um, so obviously, I guess what I would draw from that is that we were obviously doing a lot of things right. By the same token, we've had an incredibly nasty recession, and we're having a very weak recovery. And um, uh, you know, there are people who who would argue that we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't look at that half-empty glass. But I don't think that's right. Nor did, um, for example, John Maynard Keynes or Irving Fisher, who were the two the two greatest economists of the last century, think so, because um, well, we can talk about that, but. But I would just say that, um, you know, that even in the Great Depression, uh, when 
instead of having the economy sink you know, five percentage points from an incredible high, it collapsed, you know, by a third. And of course, incomes were uh, one-fifth of what they are now. A huge number of Americans still lived on the farm and were, you know, extremely poor. Um, you know, obviously, we're in a better position, but, um, but a recession is, is a huge waste of human um, spirit and, and um, it, you know, it can never be what you don't do, what you don't produce, uh, you know, can never be recaptured. Um, and, um, you know, I think that, that already by you know, by, um, you know, shortly after World War I, um, when it, you know, people felt, kind of understood that, well, we have, a, we have a social organization that produces rapid increases in living standards, but uh, maybe there's a way to cure these temporary but painful slumps. So um, one of the themes of this uh, Humanities Festival is tech, the intersection between tech and knowledge. And, and so I wanted to ask you about data and how it was used through um, this period that you're looking at and, and uh, how you know, people like Henry Mayhew had to go and collect it himself by going door to door in this 88 part or 90 part series that ran over the course of a year on what conditions were like in the most noxious corner of, of London. Um, today, it seems economists have every permutation of data. They have all kinds of data at their fingertips, and yet, are, are they any better at forecasting uh, where we're going economically, uh, given that they have all this data? Back then, they had almost none. Um, well, I mean, I think that, I think it's pretty clear that, <laughs> it's pretty clear from the whole history of the last 150 years that whatever economists do, Prediction is not prediction of, um, you know, cr stock market crashes and uh, you know timing of recessions is not that's not what they do very well, right? Do we agree that? <laughs> look, um, I was going to say that the you know John Maynard Keynes, who um, was despite his um, you know, kind of unique investment uh, philosophy. <laughs> um, uh, John Maynard Keynes was, uh, you know, the head of an insurance company. He, you know, he was in the market every day. He spent every morning talking to his broker. He had, he was wiped out three times, okay? Usually losing not only his own, but most of Virginia Woolf and, um, Vanessa um, uh, money as well, and um, so that hasn't that hasn't changed. Um, but that's not what is valuable about about um, you know Keynes's ideas, because uh, Keynes may not have been able to predict, uh, say the great the Great Depression, but he had a very good uh, idea for a cure, okay? So at the beginning, in 1929 and 1930, he and his American counterpart, Irving Fisher, said, look, this calamity uh, is not a sign that there is something deeply and profoundly wrong with you know, the market system and democracies, as many people, of course, feared and thought. Um, this is a temporary problem. It's a technical problem. They said, well, you know, the, um, the, um, uh, the level of employment and output in the short term is determined by the flow of money through the economy, and there's been a disruption in that. And there's a simple cure, which is to pump uh, 
money into the economy. And uh, there was a, a natural experiment ensued. The United States uh, ignored that advice uh, for several years. Britain um, for an intermediate period. And some countries like Japan and like Sweden um, took that advice immediately. The result was that what we think of as the Great Depression as a sort of homogenous and global experience was nothing like that. The countries that followed their advice and um, you know, used mo monetary stimulus, pump money into their systems by going off the gold standard, never had a Great Depression. Okay? They, they had nasty recessions. The country, the, the country that had, that really did have a Great Depression was the United States, which stayed on the gold standard until 1933. Then there was another natural experiment, which is, this, you know, the minute the U.S. Um, um, you know, went off gold, there was a resounding recovery. Okay, the Great Depression was not one long uh, trough. It actually consisted of a, a collapse, a strong recovery, and then when um, uh, the uh, uh, you know, American authorities once more decided that it was time to really clamp down on the banks and raise taxes, then the U.S. went into another steep recession. And that's what we now you know, call the Great Depression. But the point is that, that they were saying, and it sounded crazy at the time, you know, we're having engine trouble. We're having a technical problem. There's a solution to this. We're stuck at the side of the road, but it doesn't mean that we're going to go back to the horse and buggy days. It doesn't mean that, um, you know, that our children are going to live worse than we do. And in fact, Keynes, in 1931, when the world appeared to be falling apart, you know, in a, to a degree that dwarfs what has happened in the last couple of years, um, Keynes said that he was confident that when his grandchildren grew up, that living standards in Britain would be four to eight times higher than in 1930. Where did he get that number? He was just extrapolating the average increase from the previous 100 years. And if you look at his forecast, his forecast, which sounded crazy in 1931, when all kinds of people were saying, you know, the West is really washed up, we really, you know, we really need something completely new, um, is right on track, okay? Um, but he wasn't saying, gee, we shouldn't do anything. Now, there were lots of people who were arguing that nature would provide the best cure to what was ailing the world economy. And, um, you know, not only all the bank, you know, bankers and the, you know, other traditionalists, but also some economists like Friedrich Hayek and Joseph Schumpeter. And their argument was one that we still hear today, that a slump is the result of, of, exit, of the boom. In other words, if you have a big boom, you're going to be punished for it. And it's like a hangover, OK? And what's the best treatment for a hangover? You know, l let them sleep it off. That was a very... Um, and, you know, um, clean house, you know, get, your, get yourself in order, okay? And that was, you know, it was not a stupid point of view since, in fact, 
most recessions before the Great Depression cured themselves, you know. Um, after, you know, so a couple of years, things, okay? So it wasn't a stupid point of view, but it is a point of, you know, we're having that debate again right now. And what Keynes and Fisher had been saying since after World War I, when the same discussion was going on about, should we help the Europeans recover? And of course, we didn't. Um, um, you know, their argument was, look, you know, when you have a lot of unemployment and people are suffering, and particularly when they're scared about the future, um, they, you know, are very vulnerable to snake oil salesmen. And of course there was, you know, after World War I, there were a lot of communist revolutions in Munich, in Budapest, in Moscow, etc. cetera, right? And, uh, you know, um, Fisher and Keynes argued that, look, the one thing that government controls is the issuance of money. So, if, you know, if this is the problem, then, and government has the, uh, the means, it needs to employ those means because because the risk, the risk is not that, you know, the whole system will melt down and, you know, there'll never be a recovery. The risk is that by the time the recovery comes, people will have adopted, because it's a democracy, a lot of self-destructive policies, which, you know, there were lots of, lots of examples of that. Well, they, you know, lost the argument, and we had a Great Depression, but, um, you know, the, the sort of the happy ending is that, is that Keynes, who was, um, you know, still around at the end of World War II, uh, finally, um, finally succeeded, you know, his third try, and after World War II, um, FDR, and the other leaders of um, Western governments had learned from their mistakes and knew that they had to create the conditions for economic recovery after the war. And we had Bretton Woods, and that was, you know, so Keynes, who had been ignored at the end of World War I and again in the, at the beginning of the 30s, um, finally prevailed, and his critics, in particular Friedrich Hayek, uh, changed his mind and came to his side and supported Bretton Woods. So, which was, you know, yet another, um, um, you know, evolution in this and broadening out of this idea that, that we can, um, you know, affect our circumstances. Well, why don't we open it up for questions? Um, but, and as we do, I think there are microphones that will go around. What, what are your writing routines? Would you write oh, first thing <laughs> in the morning? Or, and you said, you said earlier when we were talking that a beautiful mind wrote itself. Um, this was not quite the same, writing this book. No, this was... Well, I don't really have, I have terrible work habits. So I don't feel, you know, especially if they're young, aspiring writers, I <laughs> should really. Um, I Don't follow your example, is that what you're? Don't <laughs> follow my example, because I'm not one of those people who, you know, I mean, I've always wanted to be uh, one of those people who writes every day and who goes out to the, you know, the converted garage, uh, you know, I I after breakfast and doesn't emerge. No, I was never like that and I've never, and I don't think I'll ever be like that again. Questions? Has the ability of economists to influence political policy increased or decreased in the last 50 years? 
Well, you know, judging by the numbers of economists, <laughs> um, and uh, I would say that their, um, you know, that certainly, certainly uh, they're relied on a lot more. Does it mean that it's become politically easier to make hard decisions? No. I mean, look at Europe right now. It's always easier to pick an example over there, um, which, you know, which has a problem not so, you know, very different in degree, but qualitatively similar to the 30s, which is, which is they have a gold standard, the euro, which is just a way of, of uh, all that means is that the, the rate at which money flows is controlled um, you know, by one economy, and, but may not, even if it may not suit the circumstances of all the constituents. And they also have a debt problem, which is exactly what, um, you know, what was the situation after World War I you know, unpayable debts and, you know, uh, weak currencies and, and um, um, so the choices, you know, so it's not, you don't need, um, it's not rocket science to see what the choices are. They really only, if you're in that situation, they really only uh, two things you can do, either, either those countries that are in a slump uh, and need to stimulate their economies, they can either get out, which is the equivalent of the Japanese and the Swedes going off gold immediately and, you know, thereby, which just meant that they can expand their, you know, they can pump money into their economy because the, the gold standard was preventing them from doing that, just like the euro is preventing, um, you know, Greece and Spain and Portugal from doing that. That's one option, and the other option is for the countries that are benefiting from the currency union, i.e. The, the Germans in particular, to subsidize the ones that, are, that need stimulus, okay? And you can imagine how popular that is, okay? So both of those things are politically very difficult. So that's not an issue of economic knowledge. That's an issue of political, you know, I mean, it's politics. And similarly, um, um, you know, similarly, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're in, that, in that same, in that same situation, although not as, um, not as dire with respect to our budget policy. Because uh, whatever we do or don't do is gonna be at somebody's expense, right? And so, I mean, when I look, you know, I looked at the budget numbers the other day, and if the US economy were a typical American family, just because, you know, nobody can think in these, you know, hundreds of billions, and tr not to mention trillions, but if the U.S. economy were a typical American family, what do you think the national, the outstanding national debt is? The typical American family earned about $50,000 cash last year. So what would the, what would the debt be? Do you think? Anybody? Anyone guess? What? 200,000. 200,000? Any other guesses? 90? 75. Okay. 90. I feel like an auctioneer. Okay. 35. 35,000. No. No. No, no. What I'm saying is, Instead of talking about the actual numbers, you know, like our $15 trillion, let's talk, you know, let's scale it down, okay? So if the U.S. were the average $50,000 income a year, 
what's the size of their debt? You know, what's the equivalent of the, it's 35,000, okay? Okay, because, I mean, I could say it another way, which is that our national debt is 70% of our annual national income, okay? But just to get it into, you know, into our heads in a way that we can think about it. Okay, so, and it's growing very fast. Why is it growing? Because, well, my hair's not getting whiter, thank God, but we're getting older, and, uh, and therefore, we're going to have to spend more on Social Security. So, you know, so the balance between taxes and, and uh, spending is, you know, there's a gap opening up, a long-term gap, about five percentage points. Again, if you want to think about it in terms of this family, five, what's 5% five of 50,000? Okay. Okay. My point is, my point is that, um, that um, it doesn't seem, you know, m maybe there are people who think that that level of indebtedness for this country, which has such an amazing track record of economic growth, is problematic. I don't dispute that. But compared to, compared to the problem of young people who can't get a job for several years, um, that's how we should be talking about it. In other words, we should be talking about it in very um, we should be talking about the choices that we have, not in apocalyptic and ideological language, but really as choices and admitting, well, yes, this is a lot of national debt. Ha you know, how does that compare to this amount of unemployment? Um, and I think that Somehow, I don't feel that, that, that the conversation, I'm sorry? <laughs> Say it again. Say what? <laughs> whether well, this is a lot of indebtedness or whether this is. <laughs> well, my point is that, that we have to choose among, we have to decide which, not that, you know, we have to decide which problem we want to make, we should address, right? What our priorities are, okay? And instead of being uh, terrorized with, you know, big numbers and apocalyptic predictions about how the United States is going to go bankrupt and other nonsense, okay? If we, if these, if our choices were, you know, were framed in a way that we could understand, which is very easy to do, then we could decide, we could have a rational discussion about does it make sense to, um, to borrow more now to reduce unemployment? Does it make sense to raise taxes temporarily to uh, slow the growth of this, of this debt? I mean, these are real choices, but they have to be um, talked about in as you know as alternatives that we can grasp, not as well. You know, if you don't do this, we're all going to go to hell in a handbasket, and therefore, you know. Um, well, let, let's. Um, we have about two minutes, so let's see if we can get a very short. Uh, we have time for one more short question Hi. and short answer. Uh, hi, uh, I am not a trained economist, and my Can knowledge speak up, in please? is my knowledge in economy is limited. And when you said after World War One that Sweden and Japan they pumped their money into economy, would you explain that? What was that? What I did? No, that was at the beginning of the depression. But uh, what was the process of pumping well, them? It just. It's exactly what Ben Bernanke and the Federal Reserve, I mean, we had a financial crap, you know, our financial system really froze 
and we had a, you know, we had a severe recession. However, we didn't have, we didn't go anywhere near the, you know, what happened in the 1930s when prices fell by one third, when output fell by one third, when unemployment was 25 percent. Why? Because, because we, our Federal Reserve understands, and Ben Bernanke in particular, who was a student of the Great Depression and a student of Milton Friedman, who studied the Great Depression, uh, understands that you can't let that happen. That when there's an implosion like that, you pump, you know, you, you make more money available to the banking system, which in turn makes it available to consumers and, and businesses. And that's why we had a nasty recession, more or less comparable to the 1980s recession, and why we're not having deflation, and why we're having a recovery, even if it's a lackluster one, okay? So once again, we've had a natural, a natural experiment which seems to show that you know, monetary policy does work, and maybe we should be talking about, you know, should the Fed be more aggressive? Um, you know, again, we're not, we're not helpless. Um, we, we've done some things right. Maybe we need to do more of them. And I'm, I'm going to have to wrap things up here. Sylvia will be um, signing books afterwards. So if you wanted to, uh, perhaps some of these conversations could be continued a little bit. Please thank you. join me in thanking her for being here.